Hello everyone, welcome to basic electronics tutorials. In this video, I am going to discuss about the working principle of a semiconductor diode. A semiconductor diode is one of the most basic switching elements used in the electronics field. How is it created? It is created by simply joining an N type semiconductor material with a P type semiconductor material. Figure 1 here indicates the generic structure and the symbolic representation of a semiconductor diode. As what can be seen here, a diode has two terminals. The terminal towards the P type material is called as anode and the terminal towards the N type material is called cathode. Since we said a semiconductor diode is created by simply joining a N type semiconductor material with a P type semiconductor material, let us now understand what happens when the N type semiconductor is joined to a P type semiconductor. I will be explaining this using the same diagram which is figure 1 here. When a N type material is joined with a P type material, as what can be seen in figure 1 part A, the electrons and holes in the vicinity of the region near the junction, which is this particular region, they will combine. This will result in the lack of free carriers or depletion of free carriers in this region and hence this region is called depletion region. This depletion region will block any free movement of charge carriers through the device and therefore no current can flow through the device as long as the depletion region exists. To understand how a diode operates, we need to bias the diode. So what is biasing? The term bias refers to the application of an external voltage across the two terminals of the device to obtain a certain response. The semiconductor diode can be biased in three different ways and these are listed here in the second point. The first one is the no bias condition, the second one is the forward bias condition and the last one is the reverse bias condition. Let us now discuss each of these biasing conditions in complete detail. I am going to start the biasing discussion with the no bias condition. Figure 2 and 3 here indicate the no bias condition. Please note under this condition there is no external voltage applied that is Vd which is the applied voltage is equal to 0 volts. Since no voltage is applied to the device, there is no movement of majority charge carriers due to the presence of the depletion region. Since there is no movement of charge carriers, we can now say that there is no current flowing across the device. Under this condition, the device is equivalent to an open circuit and behaves like an isolated resistor. However, the minority charge carriers that are in the depletion region, which is this region here, they can move to the other semiconductor material causing a very small current called as the leakage current. But the magnitude of this leakage current is considerably negligible. This no bias condition is not of much use to us as it does not extract any type of response from the device. Please note, we only study this just for the sake of its existence. The second biasing condition I will be discussing is the reverse bias condition. If the applied external voltage is connected across the PN junction diode in such a way that the positive terminal of the external voltage source, which is this one, is connected to the N type material, which is the cathode and the negative terminal of the applied voltage source which is this one is connected to the P type semiconductor material then such a biasing condition is called reverse biased condition. To understand how the semiconductor diode behaves in the reverse biased condition we will be using the basic physics principle which is like charges repel each other 
and opposite charges attract each other. Now, since the positive terminal of the voltage source is connected to the n type material, it attracts electrons which are the majority charge carriers in this region. At the same time, the minority charge carriers in the n type material, which are holes, are repelled towards the depletion region. That is, electrons move in this direction and holes move in this direction. In a similar approximation, since the negative terminal of the voltage source is connected to the p type material, it attracts holes which are the majority charge carriers from that region. At the same time, the minority charge carriers in the p type material, which are electrons, are repelled towards the depletion region. So, now for the p type material, electrons move towards the depletion region and holes move towards the external voltage. The minority charge carriers in each semiconductor region are forced towards the depletion region and they get attached to the depletion region causing the width of the depletion region to increase. This is bound to happen because you see in the n type material holes are moved towards the depletion region and in the p type material electrons are moved towards the depletion region. This will cause the depletion region width to increase. As the depletion region width increases, the potential required by the majority charge carriers to cross the junction also increases and therefore, the majority carrier current, which is the device current, effectively reduces to zero. This is shown in this part here. Please note, the majority carrier current is effectively zero in the reverse bias condition. However, the electrons and holes in the depletion region can still pass on to the other semiconductor material just like as what we discussed under the no bias condition and therefore, there still exists a minority carrier current that flows across the device. This is shown in this part here. But as we previously discussed, the magnitude of this minority carrier current is considerably negligible. The minority carrier current that exists under the reverse bias condition is called as the reverse saturation current and it is represented by Is, which is shown here. Please note, the reverse saturation current is considerably small and is usually measured in microamperes and sometimes in nanoamperes. Something very interesting about this current is that we call it as reverse saturation current. Why do we call it as saturation current? The term saturation comes from the fact that this current reaches its maximum level very quickly and does not change significantly with increase in the reverse bias voltage. That is the reason why we call it as reverse saturation current. Now, if the applied potential, which is Vd, is increased to a very large value, the potential across the depletion region becomes so high that the depletion region just breaks down either because of the Zener breakdown or the avalanche breakdown process. This voltage at which the device breaks down is called as the breakdown voltage. In some of the textbooks, we call it as reverse breakdown voltage. When the depletion region breaks down, a pathway is created for all type of charge carriers to move across the device and this causes a sudden large current to flow across the device and the diode now behaves as if it is a short circuit. It should be noted that both the Zener as well as the avalanche breakdown processes are non-destructive and are reversible as long as the amount of current flowing across the device does not reach critical levels. If this current reaches the critical level, then the device will overheat and will suffer from thermal damage. Figure 5 here indicates the diode breakdown in the reverse bias condition. Please note this particular part here. For a large value of the reverse bias voltage, the current across the diode is considerably small, which is the reverse saturation current. 
Once the applied reverse voltage reaches the breakdown voltage, the diode will break down causing a sudden increase in the current and here in this particular picture we have indicated the Zener breakdown and the region so formed is called as Zener region. So in summary, in the reverse bias condition, the width of the depletion region increases and therefore the majority charge carriers fail to move across the device which effectively causes the current across the device to reduce to zero. If the voltage is further increased at some point which is the reverse breakdown voltage level, the diode will break down causing a large current to flow through the device and this is either caused by the Zener breakdown or the avalanche breakdown. Let us now move towards the last biasing condition which is the forward biasing condition. If the applied external voltage is connected across the PN junction diode in such a way that the positive terminal of the source which is this one is connected to the P type semiconductor material and the negative terminal of the supply is connected to the N type semiconductor material then such a biasing condition is called forward biased or on condition. Since the positive terminal of the voltage source is connected to the p-type semiconductor material, it attracts electrons which are the minority charge carriers from this region. At the same time, the majority charge carriers in the p-type material which are holes are repelled towards the depletion region. So, at the p-type semiconductor material, electrons are moving out of the semiconductor material and holes are moving towards the depletion region. In a similar approximation, since the negative terminal of the voltage source is connected to the N-type semiconductor material, it attracts holes which are the minority charge carriers in the region. At the same time, the majority charge carriers in the N-type material, which are electrons, are repelled towards the depletion region. So, at the N type semiconductor, electrons are moved towards the depletion region and holes are moved out of the semiconductor material. The majority charge carriers which are repelled towards the depletion region will then recombine with the ions near the depletion region which are shown in this part of the figure and hence the width of the depletion region will start to reduce. As the applied voltage increases, the depletion region will continue to decrease in width. At some point, the depletion region completely breaks down and the majority carrier current starts to flow in an exponential manner. The external voltage at which this happens is called turn on voltage or the knee voltage of the device. Please note that the knee voltage varies for the type of the semiconductor material used. For germanium based diodes it is 0.3 volts, for silicon based diodes it is 0.7 volts and for gallium arsenide diodes it is 1.2 volts. Please note that the minority carrier flow still exists and has the same magnitude as in either the no bias condition or the reverse bias condition. However, it is now neglected due to the magnitude of the majority carrier flow across the junction. So we understand that there is a leakage current flowing across the device whether the device is under no bias condition, reverse bias condition or forward bias condition. When the depletion region completely vanishes, the diode will turn on causing a free movement of charge carriers across the circuit and in such a condition the diode is said to be turned on. In the figure 7 here I have shown the VI characteristics of the diode. When I say VI characteristics it is the input applied voltage versus the diode current. Let me now start the discussion with the forward bias condition first. As you can see here, until the forward applied voltage is equal to the knee voltage of the device, the current across the device is considerably negligible 
and is equivalent to the leakage current. Once the applied voltage reaches the knee voltage, the junction vanishes and the device current starts to increase in an exponential manner. Please note the diode current is not linear but it must be exponential. Coming to the reverse bias condition, the diode behaves as if it is an isolated resistor as long as the reverse applied voltage is not equal to the reverse breakdown voltage. Under such condition, the current across the device is considerably small and is equal to the reverse saturation current and usually this is in terms of microamperes or nanoamperes. Once the applied voltage reaches the reverse breakdown voltage, the diode breaks down and this causes a very sudden and a very large current to flow across the device and this process is called as either Zener breakdown or avalanche breakdown. Please note that a diode is commonly used as a switching element. So it is the first quadrant of the VA characteristic curves that are most important to us. Let us now write an equation for the current across the device in terms of the other parameters what we have discussed till now. This is shown in equation 1 here. The characteristics of the semiconductor diode can be defined using equation 1 and this equation is called as Shockley equation. Please note this equation is applicable for both the forward as well as the reverse bias regions. The equation states that the current across the device which is ID is equal to IS multiplied by e to the power of Vd divided by Nvt minus 1 amperes where IS is the reverse saturation current, Vd is the applied forward bias voltage or reverse bias voltage across the diode and N is the ideality factor. Please note ideality factor is a function of the operating conditions as well as the physical constructions of the diode. Typically it varies between 1 and 2. Lastly the parameter Vt here is called as the thermal voltage and this is given in equation 2 here. The thermal voltage is equal to K into Tk divided by Q volts where K is the Boltzmann constant and is equal to 1.38 into 10 to the power of minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Tk is the absolute temperature in Kelvin and is equal to 273 plus the temperature in degree Celsius. And lastly, Q is the magnitude of the electronic charge and is equal to 1.6 into 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs. Right. With that, we have come to the end of this discussion on the working principle of a semiconductor diode. In my next video, I will discuss about diode equivalent circuits and its load line analysis. So, stay tuned. Well, that is the end of this video. If you like this video, kindly like and share this video and subscribe to my channel for more tutorials on basic electronics. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.